Hi, Dom. Hi, Vanessa. How's it going? Um, just struggling with my with my bitter coffee and with inflation. It's, it's funny. We actually have an economic expert, but because of the nature of our podcast of recording interviews a little ahead of time, sometimes we are not as on the news as, um, you know, the news. We didn't actually talk to our guest about inflation, which is kind of like the mm-hmm. talk of the town. I'm also surprised that your news peg item was inflation and not, you know, <laughs> war in your country. But <laughs> that's I mean, on your mind. <laughs> I, 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 like, I, I feel like there's time, times when, when a certain subject reaches saturation in your own mind, there's nothing more you can say mm-hmm. about it. Plus, it's often true about subjects like Israel or even uniquely Israel that times like these are the, uh, the worst time to have discussions right, about them right. because nobody's listening. And there are no conversations. I, I would have been rich. I would have beaten inflation if I had gotten a dollar for every post that said, this isn't complicated. Mm. Here's what's right. Here's, here, here's the moral equation that you need to follow to understand what's happening right now in Israel. Anyone who starts a post about Israel's, this isn't complicated. Need, needs to rethink their, yeah. I, their, yes. their life. I don't even know what they need to rethink, but they need to rethink it. But... Twitter is, and American journalism broadly is the, the bullhorn of simplistic moral theologies. Complexity is not, is not in our business. So I think it's only a question of what theology you subscribe to. It's, mm-hmm. But, but, not, not, but it, if you to consider that maybe there is a, a gray ground to explore is apostasy. And certainly apostasy is a very dangerous thing when you talk about Israel in the Middle East. So I'm going to I'm going to avoid. So okay. instead we're talking so back, ba- to, back to inflation. <laughs> Our guest today is Rebecca Henderson, Professor Rebecca mm. Henderson. Yes, she's a professor at Harvard University. Uh, she's a Brit. She is the author of uh, the book Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. I like the book cover because it says in a world on fire is red. It's huh, nice. Our next guest actually has a world on fire on, on his book's cover, but we'll we'll get there next week. Mm-hmm. So spoiler alert there, a little teaser action. Um, but yeah, I came across this book. Funnily enough, I was, <laughs> I was in a little book club um, and the folks in my book club read this book. Um, you, you'll love this, Dom. We read it as a follow up to <laughs> Ibram X. Kendi. <laughs> Um, which, you know, uh, mostly because we started, as we were talking about race, we started talking a lot about capitalism and we thought, hey, what about this book? Um, it's, it's, what, Rebecca has some interesting background. She's worked with a lot, like on the boards of a lot of companies, advising a lot of companies about ways they can be more, uh, kind of conscientious about the way they do business, in particular with regards to sustainability and environmental protection. So that's kind of her background. And so, but this book, which, and which we talk about a lot in our conversation, is really why capitalism is worth preserving. And despite all of the inequities and ex- environmental degradation that it has wrought, it is still the best system that we have. And Rebecca suggests that indeed it is the the best tool we have for actually re- rectifying a lot of these situations. Speaking of apostasy, I feel like saying something like that, like capitalism can be the solution too, is not looked at well by the uh, apropos the the students of Ibram X Candy, but we'll we've spoken enough about about that book <laughs> in the past. I will say that this is what grabbed me about the book when you started reading it is just like oh a, a, an admission that capitalism is flawed while also thinking that the solution should be free market minded mm. like wow right, right. <laughs> who who thought we could have this conversation in 2020, which was when we were reading the book right. And and I I'm I'm really glad where we had the chance to talk to Rebecca because not only does her work reflect that sort of very honest, thoughtful, meticulous analysis of markets and and how to improve and fix them. Also in person, in interview, yeah. she was very open to take on all our stupid challenges. Yes, yeah. And and take them seriously. And uh she 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 never brushed off anything with with you know simplistic platitudes right. or sound bites. She is 
She is great. Yeah, I, she I, was, I loved having this conversation with her. Yeah, she was, was great. She worth was the wait. She was there to like engage, to debate with us, to go back and forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that the energy was like her her ethos too about like not necessarily sticking in the black and white, trying to make get into the the nuance and the complexity. I think was right right on right on board with our you know with this little pod of ours. So no, it was a, it was really fun. Since we had very limited time with her, we hardly got to talk about current events right. in this conversation which again is is is, is fine and yeah. it was That's why we're not a daily show <laughs> exactly but it's it is worth mentioning just you know I've, I've conveyed my trademarked pessimism in in the interview but i think the way that the conversations about the economy and and, and economic reform is being conducted right now in the U.S. at least shows how far we are from actually being serious about our problems and what actual solutions are. You know, my pet peeve, and we brought it up in our conversation with Zor Goshen, which actually I think is worth re-listening to yeah. if, if if people are interested in our conversation with Rebecca. You might want to go back and listen to our fascinating talk with Professor Zor Goshen from Columbia University, How to Steal Wealth from your workers with the best intentions. One of the topics that we touched on is corporate taxes, which is an issue that I, I like using sometimes as a litmus test to gauge whether the person I'm speaking with is more concerned with real economic prosperity and ameliorating inequality, or is it more about a pretense to justice? Because the economic argument for increasing corporate taxes is actually very weak unless you are just troubled by the aesthetic of big, monstrous corporations not paying their fair share, whatever that means. And aesthetically, I share this intuition. It just doesn't make for good policy. And the way that Biden's policies so far have been rolled out seem to take a lot of their cues from the taxes is the solution to everything, period, type of crowds, no matter the details of the policy. And in fairness, it could be that what comes across right now as pandering is actually just a negotiation tactic and we'll see how actually things turn out. But what really gets to me is that whenever some of our colleagues see policies that they like being posted by politicians, preferably politicians that they voted for, they become 90% less critical on the hmm. details. I mean, you could, you could tell they're there is some expertise involved in this, but there is sort of a blind trust that, oh, well, the experts did their number crunching in the background, and therefore it must work out. We'll just <laughs> take their word for it. And just think back how it was during the Trump years where journalists, as they should, l l examined every single punctuation semicolon. mark and, and semicolon of every piece of legislation to figure out what kind of impact this is going to have, what kind of unintended consequences this might have. And, 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 and now, the sort of story that I'm seeing coming out, like literally a few seconds ago, I got a push from the New York Times that said, Biden's, uh, Biden's aides describe his work as meticulous attention to details. Like, what, what, kind, what kind of a news piece is this? Aides describe their boss as wonderful. This is, this is crazy. This is not the sort of journalism that we need at a moment when we're trying to pass economy sh redefining legislation. But hey, hey, don't worry. Don't worry. It's fine. It's fine. They know what they're doing. We're moving in the right direction. You know, it's, you, you feel it. It's in the right direction. So like, don't worry. It's going to work itself out. It's going to, you know, this is what you need the fourth estate to let you know, just trust, trust the politicians. They just trust them. And then, and then we get inflation and people are like, oh, well, how, where, where, did, where did that come from? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, back to Rebecca Henderson. Yeah. So, um, one other thing that I that I did want to point out that I thought was um, interesting. So, part of the reason why I wanted to read this book is because my my sister works at B Lab, and she's very much about this kind of social conscientious. Uh, like business orientation of like companies will save the world. And I've, I've always been a little bit skeptical of it. And like she and I have, have had conversations about this. And when I was reading the book, it seemed like uh, Rebecca Henderson was very much pushing for this idea that companies are going to eventually self-regulate. And I, was very skeptical even as I was reading it. And so I actually really liked that we got the chance to, to talk about that in this conversation because I think she unpacks it in a way that made me understand where, where what the point she's trying to make there and also made me understand why, why, she, why regulation is going to be such an important answer for this. And it's actually going to 
companies are going to be the ones driving uh, democratic institutions to regulate them more, which on its face sounds like a really preposterous theory, but she really unpacks why why this could happen. So I, I will I'll just throw that in as, as a, a, for me, one of the more interesting moments in this conversation. All right. So we're going to go to Rebecca. Just a reminder, follow us on uncertain.substack.com or at uncertain pod on Twitter and Instagram. And um, if you're feeling generous, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that would be awesome. It's the right thing to do, and it will seriously help us. Oh, and obviously tell your friends and enemies to listen, so we'll have more people to argue with. All right. Well, with that... With that... Professor Rebecca Henderson. Um, well, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us as we you know, dive into this conversation. Would you mind kicking us off with just the kind of the short elevator bio, uh, the <laughs> elevator pitch of your background in a, in a nutshell. Sure. I'm a Brit and a professor at Harvard at the Harvard Business School, where I helped found the Business and Environment Initiative. And I recently published a book called Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Brilliant. Well, so that is definitely the main reason why we wanted to talk with you today, because I read this book a few months ago, and I wanted to talk with you more about it and kind of get into the nitty gritty of some of the things that you wrote about in there. Um, and I will just say that during the, the month that Vanessa was reading it, she was scribbling furiously on the on the sidelines, <laughs> taking notes. Oh, uh, she was, really? as we say, engaged with the book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Vanessa, that is the best possible compliment. <laughs> Thank, Thank you well, so Thank you for much. writing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also also uh, curious too because my sister is very much in this field. She's a, she works at B Lab, and so she's thinking about this stuff all the time. And she she kind of comes across with the passion of the convert, um, and I'm a bit more of the skeptic. So I, I had a lot of questions for you. And I'm just the asshole, so yeah, that's yeah. my role in the conversation. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it'll to be seen, to be determined. So basically, I think one of one of the first questions we wanted to ask you is that I think we're at a moment in time right now where capitalism is not getting a terribly good rap, right? Like there's a lot of anti-capitalist sentiment on both sides, on the left and the right, right? Um, but I think from reading your book that you were trying to argue that, you know, as much as there are issues and problems, the solution can come indeed from capitalism itself. Um, but because there's it's there's so much kind of conversation around this, I want to make sure that we're like really specific about where what is actually going wrong in our society today that we can lay at the feet of capitalism. And I was wondering if, if you could kind of help us diagnose from your perspective, you know, what are the, the issues at play really? Sure. Environmental degradation. We're running through our resources and endangering the life support systems of the planet. Climate change is real and a real and present danger. Accelerating inequality and racial exclusion not just in the US, but right across the world, minority populations are largely excluded from the mainstream. And third, our institutions, in particular our governments, which are the natural place to look for solutions to these problems, are, how shall we put it, troubled. Hmm. And I mean, it's not just in the US, we're seeing left and right wing populism bursting out all over. We're seeing trust in government collapse. Uh, the Edelman Trust Survey now says that business is the most trusted institution on the planet, which, you know, I'm a business school professor, but that's weird. <laughs> um, you know, what's with that? Um, and, and sort of the normal mechanisms we might use to address problems like climate change or inequality um, appear to be kind of broken. So um, that for me is the kind of diagnosis what's wrong. Now, Vanessa, you asked a very subtle question, which is what role has capitalism played in driving these problems? And let me be clear, some of the problems we face are just because there are so many of us and we're consuming so much and sort of kind of appropriating the world. And because gross generalization, humans have always been a little greedy and a little selfish, or some humans have been. So there's always been inequality. So what, is, what does capitalism have to do with the current moment? And um, as you know, because you read my book, 
I, I consider myself a, a dyed-in-the-wool capitalist. I think it's one of the great inventions of the human race, that it's the source of innovation and prosperity and freedom. I mean, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I don't think there's any way we're going to solve the problems like climate change or inequality without capitalism. So let me be quite clear about that at the beginning of the conversation. But yes, I think capitalism in its current incarnation has contributed to the problems we face and that it badly needs to be reformed. So, so here's the core idea. I love free markets, genuinely competitive free markets, but markets only work their magic when prices reflect real costs. And right now, our prices are badly out of whack. So let's just focus on climate change and fossil fuels for a moment. You know, if you imagine that I'm holding in my hands uh, $10 worth of coal-fired electricity, uh, that's about enough power to uh, charge my cell phone for about 10 years, which is a pretty good deal. But here's the problem. It didn't actually cost $10 to make this $10 worth of coal-fired electricity because burning coal throws off toxins like lead and mercury and particulates, and they cause immediate damage to human health right here, right now. Uh, millions of people die every year because we're still burning coal. And um, these impacts are greatest in often in marginal communities. Right here in the US, it's people of color who tend to suffer more from respiratory illnesses and asthma and the kinds of things that burning fossil fuels causes. So, you know, what's the price for this? Well, my colleagues in the School of Public Health say, well, you know, it's really hard, high error bars, but $8. <laughs> you know, $8 and we think that's an underestimate. And then burning that coal also generates greenhouse gases, which contributes to global warming. And, and what's the cost of that? Well, again, lots of debate, years of debate, but talking to my colleagues in the Department of Climate Change and Economics, maybe $8. And that's an underestimate. You know, and that's literally what they say to me. That's, that's a very conservative estimate. So what's the real cost of this $10 worth of coal-fired power? It's not 10. It's 26. And so what in effect is happening is we're subsidizing all of us to burn fossil fuels. The subsidy is the damage we're not paying for. So, I mean, this really distorts the market. Imagine you're trying to sell solar power or wind. You're competing with something that is wildly underpriced in terms of its real cost. And yet somehow you have to compete. So the market is not free and fair. And, you know, here I'm getting a little bit of e e economist speak, but when externalities are not properly priced, the market is not, you know, like the market in the textbooks of the economists. So that's one huge problem two more problems. First, firms have no incentive to vote for increased taxes or, well, not in the short term, or good education or good health. Their incentive is cut my taxes, push wages to the bottom, like I'm competing, I'm competing, I'm competing. And so that dynamic, which in a way is not their fault, right? That's a failure of the institutions around them that, you know, we don't ask people to offer jobs with living wages, that there are jobs without benefits, you know, all these kinds of problems that are accelerating inequality and our tax regime is contributing to inequality. You know, is that capitalism's fault? Kind of not. But what it looks like on the ground is, you know, the CEOs are paying themselves more and more and more and people at the bottom, you know, minimum wage hasn't kept up with inflation for the last 20, 30 years. And the last problem is that markets are only free and fair when firms can't set their own rules. When there's real competition, I mean, one of the reasons we're in trouble is, for example, on the climate change front, is the fossil fuel company said, whoa, my duty is to maximize shareholder value. Hmm. Better fight climate regulation because that's going to put me out of business. So I'm going to spend millions of dollars denying the reality of climate change. I'm going to flood the political system so that we don't get climate regulation. And I might have maximized my profits, at least in the short term, but you've imposed like a massive cost on the whole society. And again, is that capitalism's fault? That's capitalism out of balance. It's capitalism unconstrained. You know, sometimes I say capitalism is a tiger, incredibly powerful, but you have to keep it on a leash. And we let 
the rules and context and regulation that controls capitalism atrophy. It was so convenient to think that markets would solve everything, that if we just let the private sector rip, we'd be good. And I mean, we did get amazing growth and fantastic innovation and a lot of great things, but we also get, oh, whoops, we're destabilizing the climate and oh dear, our societies are not very stable anymore and full of anger and rage. So I would say capitalism is implicated, but the broader <laughs> issue is really a failure of governance of the whole society. So if I hear you correctly, there are at least three broad topics and that, that I think I also picked up from the book, and, and, and I, I hope I'm not imposing on what you just said. But broadly speaking, you have, you have the, a problem of inequality. You have a problem of uh, uh, harm to, to public goods, which is our environment, which is communities. And you have the, um, the dangers of corruption and cronyism. And those are things that, that obviously have some interrelations, but, but, but also are, are distinct problems. We were going to go into each of them, and then we're also, we've, pr we've priced out some time for, <laughs> for solutions to make sure that we, we don't miss that. But I do want to start with um, trying to understand what's a real problem, what's a symptom, and what's just an issue or something that makes us uncomfortable that is not really a problem if the core problems are treated. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about things like inequality, is inequality a problem in and of itself, or is it just an, an aesthetic discomfort that, that stems from, you know, seeing that there is uh, people falling through the floor? Like, if, if we sure. had a baseline, would we be comfortable with inequality, sure. or is it something that inherently gives us trouble? Sure, Adam, that is <laughs> so much the nub of the issue. Okay, so let's be clear. In a capitalist system, a certain degree of inequality is a feature, not a bug. We want people who work really hard and take risks and build organizations and create jobs and produce great products. We, at least I am fine with their being richer than the rest of us. No worries. Mm. I have two, two concerns with inequality in its current manifestation. The first is the degree to which it leads to lower social mobility and a lack of opportunity. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a society where all the children, regardless of who their parents are, get a decent education and decent health care and a decent shot at participating, no worries. Inequality is, you know, some people do well in life and some people don't. And as long as it's a fair playing field, you know, that's the breaks. Um, so, but I do worry that, for example, here in the, in the U.S., your chances of social, your odds of getting ahead in life are incredibly shaped by the zip code in which you live. And we know it's the zip code because people have looked at kids that get moved from zip code to zip code and, you know, the family doesn't change its economic position and, and does the experience change? It absolutely does. There are places where in this country where infant mortality is on the order of Botswana where the educational systems, and I mean no disrespect to Botswana, but that's, that's not very good. And there are educational systems, you know, we have both arguably the best educational systems in the world and the worst, places where the schools are just not working. And so to the degree that we're getting inherited status, father to kids, uh, mother to kids, I think that's very problematic. Now, again, you could argue that that's a symptom that we're not providing the kind of public goods we need to the whole society. But I think, you know, that's one reason inequality is worrying me right now. The other reason inequality, well, I guess there are two more reasons I'm worried about inequality. Hmm. One is it looks, um, it's creating so much unrest that is the perception, and, and you're, you're going to say, well, I'm confusing this with another symptom, but the perception that the system is rigged, more than 70% of people in the US, this is before the pandemic, said, you know, the system's rigged against us, the rich are basically mm -hmm. running things. To the degree that, that, that we lose legitimacy in the system, that people see their children do not have the chance of making more money than they are, mm -hmm. um, they get angry. And they look around for people to blame. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would argue to, to business people that, you know, too much inequality is socially divisive. 
that, yeah, maybe it's a symptom of capitalism that the guy loading the trucks makes 15 bucks and the guy and, and the woman in the boardroom is making, you know, $20 million this year. And maybe that's fine. But, you know, do we really, does it need to be that extreme? If it's creating that much unrest, are you putting the system at risk? So that's my second concern. And my third concern, which you should feel free to dismiss, but I think there's a risk we're creating an aristocracy. This is what de Tocqueville thought was the great danger facing um, the American Republic when he came here. He said, you know, this is the most amazing place. This is the most equal society I've seen in the world. You know, anyone can get ahead, anyone can participate. There is no aristocracy. And the biggest da danger is an aristocracy of money. So I worry that we're going to have, you know, the Zuckerbergs and the Bezoses, and that there will be people who have just unbelievable wealth. I mean, the numbers are just startling. As you know, the, the Waltons now control more wealth than the entire bottom 50% of the uh, US population. And, you know, why would we worry about that? Well, because of the perception and maybe the reality that wealth gives you access and access gives you power. And, and so I worry about this radical degree of inequality that it will destabilize the political system. And we know that a very high fraction of the money given in the last election was given by like 100 individuals. And we know that when they pick up the phone, you can get anyone you want on the other end. And, and so I worry that we're really distorting the democracy. It's funny that you suggested that the last point would be the one that I disagree with, because that's actually probably where I think it's a recurring theme in almost every episode is the, the segregation of the American culture into a tiny aristocracy and the resentment that this creates with the public. I think this is something that we are seeing very clearly happening. I do think that it's largely a cultural issue, but obviously this cultural reality couldn't have been possible without the, the economic background. The second point you made sounds very much like uh, Rawls's, I think it's called the difference principle, right? That the society only uh, comes across as fair if the, the, the top earners work for the benefit of the, the, the lowest rung. Um, and I'm very much Rawlsy, and I think in that regard. So unfortunately, I, I can't disagree with you. I would only <laughs> wonder if, again, if the problem there is not inequality, is just the fact that we really do let people... I think uh, my pitch to you, and I, I just wonder what you think, is we have obviously we we are letting people fall like below what anyone would call like base basic like living conditions right in america you can what and when you really see that visual of you know walking down i don't know new york's uh, west village and seeing people on the street and then seeing people in wonderful penthouses you feel like this is insane like this is not what an advanced society should look like i feel like if everybody were kept in housing and basic healthcare and I, I guess some mobility of opportunity, people will be a lot more invigorated and maybe even less tend towards resentment, even if they make only $50,000 a year and other people make the billions of dollars a year, the difference won't make them as frustrated. The other pitch is there is, and, and that go, takes, us back, takes us to the next point of the, the ruining of public goods is that people feel that capitalism is running over their community. People feel like that it has an impact on, on their culture. You know, a lot of the resentment that led people to vote for Trump is that the, 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 the experience of they lose their center because globalism, because of hypercapitalism, they, they, they no longer have work and their life was constructed around that system of work, the, the factory or the mine and whatever it was that now once it vanished, they have lost the key to their identity and their, their communal connection. And as a result, we, they blame capitalism for you know, pulling the rug from under their feet. So I wonder, if, is that something that you see as, again, a problem of capitalism, or is that something to do with more American culture putting too much emphasis on work as opposed to finding some other cultural bonds? And because... And, and, we're talking a lot about resentment. You, when you talk about the problem of inequality, you're talking about public dissatisfaction and public disruption. Those happen when people in, see a problem, but that problem they see might not be what they think it is, right? Wow. So I hear you asking two questions. And on the first, I want to really agree with you in, in all the points you made. 
I find myself talking to groups that look at me and say, why reimagine capitalism? Why not throw it out the window? It's causing problem X, Y, Z. And I say, no, 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 that would be a real mistake. It's not capitalism per se that's causing these problems. It's the fact that we are not controlling capitalism. If we, and I don't mean like control the whole thing, but I mean constraining it, we're not giving it guardrails. And so if the worry is we're letting people sink so low that the contrast between that and the penthouse is just creating enormous social frictions, then the solution is to vote in an administration that will um, improve the safety net, mandate minimum wages, I and mean, we could talk about the particular policies. But those, those are political solutions. It's not evil capitalists that have given us climate change or given us inequality. It's the fact that they we haven't put the signals, if we want to head off climate change, we haven't given the firms that signal and ditto with inequality. You know, it's very hard. I, I have more than 20 years experience on public boards. You can't just say, okay, let's raise the wages of everyone who works for us if our competitors are not going to do the same thing. You can do a bit of that, we can talk about it, but you can't say, solve inequality single-handedly if everyone you're competing with is, uh, is just you know, paying market, weight, market rates. So there I'm completely agreeing with you. On the question of, you know, if I'm in Ohio and I'm just furiously angry, because the center of my old culture has basically collapsed. And is that a problem of capitalism or is that a cultural problem? Let me try this. I actually believe enormously in the dignity of work. I'm very uncomfortable with policy provisions like the universal basic income. I think there should be a strong social safety net that people who get in bad times are unlucky, happy, you know, happy helping out in bad times. But the idea that one solution to the problem of accelerating automation and robots and AI is to pay everyone to stay home, it just makes me super uneasy. Because I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that when you work, you feel like you're contributing. You feel like you're making a difference in the world. Now, it could be any kind of work. It could be art, it could be teaching. It, you know, it doesn't have to be banging out widgets in a, in a furnace. But I think no one likes, not no one, most people don't want to be dependent. And so I think the lack of jobs in the heartland is, is a huge problem. Um, I think we could debate what caused it. Again, I don't think it's raw capitalism. I think it was the failure to manage the transition, right? There was a kind of cheerful, well, the plant closes down, but another one will move in, in the midst of a, a very strong economic dynamic that economic activity is moving to larger and larger agglomerations and to people with more and more education. And, you know, that, that's a structural problem. That's like a deep working out of the economy. But we just sort of didn't address it. We didn't talk about it. We didn't try and ameliorate it. And so, you know, I'm in somewhere like this. The plants disappeared. My kids are, you know, I probably, you know, I, I have friends or family with opioid addiction. I mean, it's, it's really dire in some of these communities. So I don't think that's just a cultural problem. I mean, I think culture might help. Um, but I, I think it's. I think we need to think about more than a cultural solution. I, I think I'm having a little bit of trouble disentangling this idea of capitalism and what capitalism is versus capitalism with guardrails, right? Because it sounds like what you're saying is capitalism's not the problem. We just haven't controlled it properly. But I think when a lot of people are talking about what they conceive of as the ills of capitalism, it's because they're they're imagining that capitalism is something that exists inherently without guardrails. If it had guardrails, surely it would be we'd call it something else or something. So I'm just I'm just curious if I mean have we had capitalist successful capitalistic systems that have more guardrails and do we still call it capitalism or do we call it do we define it as something different? Absolutely we have. I was talking to a friend about my book and he said Rebecca you shouldn't have called it reimagining capitalism you should have said called it could we please go back to US capitalism of the 50s and 60s only without the misogyny and the racism. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I said, well, it's not great for a book title. <laughs> not too catchy. But, <laughs> but I mean, absolutely. I would buy it. <laughs> um, you know, what we have at the moment is kind of a rapacious capitalism, but we've seen both historically and I think even now see across the world very different forms of capitalism. Um, in the US in the 50s and 60s, not everything was perfect. Absolutely not. See the, you know, the asterisks about the racism and the misogyny. Um, but in general, there was a much stronger balance between business, government, and um, organized labor. And wages, real wages were much higher. And firms indeed talked in the annual reports about being stakeholder for oriented and they reported their impact on different communities. And, you know, it, again, it wasn't perfect, but my goodness, real incomes really grew for everyone in the economy. And um, there was, I think, great progress made. If you, I mean, but there, we, we do need to push back and say, you know, and, and I think you, you you can already tell where I come down on capitalism. So I'm definitely not uh, a, a hypercritic. Um, but you, you, when we're talking about the 50s, we are talking about a reality where basically half of the American population is locked out of work to some degree. Oh, for sure. But one of, so one when, of the... When we talk about real, real wages, it is also a factor of being a, like a, a diminished workforce, which means higher wages. Whoa, 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 whoa. I think the econometrics on that are super tricky. Um, Adam, I mean, I completely take your point, but one of the major sources of U.S. post-war growth was the gradual inclusion of those communities into the workforce, particularly women. But then after the first 15, 20 years, the um, inclusion of, of communities of color, particularly Black Americans and Hispanic Americans. So, um, and I think... No, I, no I, I would like an expansion. Because if, this is, if this is a myth, then I, I would like you to bust it. For us. The piece of evidence I find most persuasive is the correlation between union membership and real wages. And the fact that in, um, in, in Germany and uh, Denmark and Japan, we've not seen anything like the huge increase in inequality we've seen in the US, mm. in the US system. And, you know, the word union is very, very charged, and it means very different things in different societies. But in both Germany and Japan, there is more organized support for maintaining wages at the bottom half of the distribution. And again, horrible generalization. I think it's very hard to argue that those societies um, are significantly less innovative or productive or even grew much more slowly than the U.S. And measures of social welfare are, by some counts, significantly higher. You know, it's fashionable to diss Japan because they haven't had real economic growth in the last 20 years, but they have one of the highest living standards on the planet. It's still the third largest, it's the third largest economy in the world. It's highly innovative. <laughs> um, so yes, there are problems. I don't, not saying there's a utopian system anywhere, but I think there are so-called capitalist systems that have produced better outcomes, particularly in the last 20 years for a wider a cross section of the population. Right. I know. I, I just do wonder specifically when the case of the US, like when you're thinking about to what extent those things like did the American system rely heavily on on being able to like limit workforce? Because, because this is the reality where, where a lot of segregationist societies develop their economic systems around those limitations in the first place and then have difficulty adapting to a more equitable world. Well, you certainly saw that in the case of the American South after the Civil War, right? Um, but, right. but I think that might be an example that, that kind of counts the other way, right? Mm. Which is the reliance on pushing wages to the bottom was a disaster once that economy was exposed to the global economy without, you know, brutally expropriated labor that they weren't paying for as their kind of secret weapon in the, in the global markets. Hmm. Um, they had a horrible time um, reacting to, to, to global change. So I think I would argue that, I think it unlikely, but I am not a macroeconomist, hmm. that the strength of the economy post-war was predicated on paying low wages to people hmm. like women and people of color at the margin. And in fact, one of the strengths of the economy was bringing in those uh, those kind uh, those previously excluded populations 
uh, giving them education, giving giving them, um, you know, capital and the ability to compete. I, I, I'm not a, a, a fixed sum. I guess I am a real capitalist. I think the more people you bring in and the more education you give them, the bigger the economy. And it's a mistake to rely on keeping wages down. I mean, and again, I think Germany is a really good example of this. You know, they, they had to keep wages high because that was the social construction and the, and the governance of Germany. And so they invested like crazy in making the workforce really highly educated. And, and that's, I mean, they have a ridiculous share of manufacturing export, exports globally. It's, you know, it's again, not perfect, but, a, but really quite a successful economy um, for what it's worth. Vanessa, do you want to take us to the shareholders problem? Well, I, yes, but I do want to ask a quick question about the um, just what ex- how things went wrong, which I think will definitely lead us into shareholders. Because it, I would have assumed that in the fifties and sixties, you know, this I correct me on my timelines, but this is kind of when Milton Friedman is first sure. writing, right? And this yep. is when people are first really eagerly holding on to his his ideas and so i guess i would have thought that there would would have been like a wholesale um like let's go feet first into this kind of way but i what i'm what i'm gathering from talking to you is that it was actually a slower progression than that in the 50s and 60s there were more guardrails and over time we've kind of veered stronger into this friedman-esque version of what is capitalism and that's why things have the the things have kind of started falling apart? Absolutely. One way to think about it is we've been talking a lot about the dangers of markets out of control. We haven't talked about the dangers of governments out of control. You know, you need to keep these two major institutions in balance at the highest level. And one way of reading the 50s and 60s, particularly if you were an economist like Milton Friedman, is, whoa, we have too many guardrails. Hmm. We have too much government. And if we pulled back a little and gave the free market more scope, we would do better. And um, it's a problem that managers think they're focused on stakeholders rather than just their shareholders because, hey, they're using that as an excuse to hang out and not work as hard as they could be. That's more Michael Jensen than um, Milton Friedman. But, you know, the, the, the two sort of ideas emerge and start reinforcing each other. And those ideas basically say we could be running the engine faster. Capitalism could be better and cleaner. And then in the 70s, we get the first major oil shock and stagflation. And the economy starts shaking. And people are like, whoa, maybe these economics guys are right. Maybe the problem is too much government. Let's pull back on government. Maybe the problem is managers aren't serving their investors strongly enough. Let's give them incentives to really deliver investment return. And you can imagine that in the short term, you could think of this as a correction, right? Always swinging between these pendulum of too much state, too much market. And you know, maybe there are certainly government regulations in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that I'm not a fan of. And I think getting rid of was great and really did help the economy, like deregulating airlines, excellent move. Deregulating mm-hmm. telecommunications, fabulous move. I mean, there are certainly some things that really clearly made a difference. But what happened when that when we began that swing is it was accompanied by government is bad. We should drown government in the bathtub. So in, in a way, I think we, we swung like way too far away. And, and for me, that's the story of, of what happened over the last 50 years. So now we're looking at the other side of the pendulum. We're going like, whoa, kind of overcorrected. <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's move more back towards the middle. Uh, at least that's how I see it. And this idea of the the shareholder primacy of the whole point of running a company is to satisfy shareholders. Where, where does that come into play? Well, if you believe that your first duty is to take care of shareholders' money, in, on one level, it's a moral responsibility. They gave you the money. You should give them the highest possible returns. Now, what that does is ignore the social character of a firm and the fact that firms are embedded in society. And I talked earlier about, you know, for some firms, the easiest way to make money is to corrupt the political process. I don't think that's what Milton Friedman meant, but that was sort of the kind of where it ended up. 
And I think in the beginning, there was a probably a thought of, well, of course, you need to focus on other constituencies, you need to be balanced, you need to think of the long term, but shareholders are important. And when, then we got to this crazy place where, no, no, it's all about shareholders, and it's about shareholders next week. And, you know, I can instantly sell your firm, you know, I can get an activist in stock or a PE firm can come in if you're having a bad year, let's buy you cheap. Um, and, and basically, if, if, say, you had been investing in your employees or doing a long term kind of strategy, you became very vulnerable to that kind of short term, you're not maximizing shareholder value right now. So it, it, for me, I, I'm not saying we should th throw shareholder value out the window. I mean, as I said, I sat on public boards. So that's like A, not feasible, and B, probably not a good idea because you want to give investors a decent return. So they give you their capital and it is their money. But I think we need to balance it. I mean, what I like to say is making money is a means to an end, not an end in itself. That firms were created, given license to operate by the community on the grounds that they would increase prosperity and opportunity. That's the goal. And so the goal of the firm, I mean, it could be any one of a number of things, create great jobs, produce wonderful products, build a strong community. Of course, I need to give my investors the returns they expect, but that's a means to an end, not an end in itself. So um, add up. Is it Adam, right? Adam, Ad Adam yeah. I, I'm sort of now going in your direction towards a cultural shift in the way we think about shareholder value and its role. And of course, I want to change the accounting system so we can measure this at the same time, because otherwise, you know, words are cheap. Yeah, no, this is where it gets interesting. So if I understand you correctly, when you say a shift from money as um, uh, an end in itself to a means towards an end, you're not talking about the individual level, right? We're not talking about just, I mean, I guess that's partly if you want to make a cultural shift, you want to make a, a society that is not singularly obsessed with making a profit. But what you mean is that a firm needs to understand itself as, as something that creates value to society beyond merely raising the stock for shareholders, right? So it's not just something that you, you go to the casino of the uh, finance market, throw some money in and hope that in 10 years, five years, two years, you can pluck it back out and, and have more money. And that's all that it's good for, but something more. Exactly. And the interesting point is that this needs to be reflected not just in our school books, we also need something that realigns the incentives in a way that the people in those firms absorb the externalities that they're concerned about and, and, and factor that into their profit motive. So, but how? How do you do that? And I'll just one more piece of ramble because <laughs> when I'm thinking about the damage to public goods that, that corporations have done, and specifically when it comes to environmentalism, the other week, literally the other week, there was a, I don't remember if it was the Motley Fool or one of the other um, financial journals. It's a journal that I remember repeatedly reading articles about the promise of green energy, switch to green energy, the important, like blah, 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 blah. A lot of uh, boosterism from a very clearly felt uh, moral perspective. And then last week when you had the first signs of a budding inflation, here are the stocks you should buy to offset the inflation, Chevron and Shell. Yeah. <laughs> okay, when it comes down to your wallet, people don't want to take the risk. People don't care about society and community. They care about like, how do I make sure that my money isn't worthless a week from now? Sure, for sure. And I think we can all understand at least that impulse. So, Adam, I am not suggesting that firms make philanthropic con contributions to the public good. I'm not suggesting that, hey, they should reduce the rate of return on capital and in return, we're going to address climate change. I don't think it's feasible. I wouldn't believe it right. if firms told me they were going to do it. I'm suggesting two things. The first is if firms broaden their horizons and start to think this way, that there really are win-wins that the world is changing very fast, that the expectations of consumers, employees, and regulators is changing very fast, and that there is money to be made in understanding we have to transform the entire economy. Look at Tesla, look at Impossible Foods, you know, these firms, or in my book, I talk about Eric Osmondson, right, who, you know, 
became the CEO of a garbage company, which seemed like a totally odd and weird thing to do. But he had a vision of how he could transform the garbage business to both reduce global emissions and build a profitable business with a significant barrier to entry and an economy of scale. Um, so I'm talking about, I think those opportunities are out there, but I'm completely with you. They are absolutely not enough to address the world's problems. Even if every company on the planet started saying, okay, I'll change my light bulbs because I get 17% rate of return, doesn't get us where we need to go. What it might do is a number of things. One, it makes addressing these problems legitimate, like, oh, wow, climate change mm. must be really a, a big deal. Two, it begins to demonstrate alternative business models. So you get other people looking around going, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I should do that too. And it begins to get firms thinking about like, oh my God, this is a public goods problem. Can't do it alone. Let's try cooperating with each other. You know, let's only buy sustainable palm oil. And, you know, we'll make sure that nobody buys the bad stuff. And if we only buy the good stuff, it doesn't mean we, we lose competitively. And it's much better for our brand and for the long-term security of our supply chain. So they just start acting cooperatively. They work out pretty quickly, like, oh, it's really hard to cooperate because, you know, we're all thinking about short-term profits. So, okay, I promised my employees, I built a business model around this. Now I need someone to regulate me. Who can I get to regulate me? Maybe the finance people. We could talk more about that because I think the enormously concentrated wealth, which is a problem in itself, and we can come back and talk about that. But the good thing about the fact that wealth is so concentrated is the really, really wealthy people, the people controlling gazillions of dollars are going, oh, climate change is really a problem. I mean, it's really a threat. It's an economic threat. And so we should push the firms in our portfolio to do something about it. Let's push them to cooperate. Let's push them to adopt plans and metrics and make sure that we, we move everything. That might help with climate change. It's not going to help with inequality and exclusion and, and, uh, and equity. Um, but, you know, I would not have believed it 15 years ago. But the other thing this does is the firms go, oh, we need government. <laughs> regulation would be useful. <laughs> um, that the only way really to solve these problems is to change the rules that govern us. The only really long-term solution to climate change is to make it expensive or impossible to emit greenhouse gases. Which is basically yeah. what, you know, tort regimes are for, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's why you need government to because you're not going to absorb the externalities. You, you need government to tell you, yeah, you, we will fine you for it. And this will reflect the cost exactly. that you're inflicting. Exactly. So the whole point, you know, I wrote this book to try and persuade business that, yes, there was money to be made in the short term, that there was a collective case for action, that not addressing these problems was going to be a disaster collectively, and to try and open up a conversation about business needs to lobby for these kinds of regulations, it needs to lobby to get money out of politics, and that this is the long-term solution. And I mean, it, it can sound kind of wild to say, well, business is going to lobby to reduce its power. I mean, I'm not suggesting it's going to happen tomorrow or that everyone in business is going to do this, but I think it would be incredibly helpful to have some fraction of the world's leading firms saying, you know, democracy is a good idea. You know, clean elections is a good idea. And so it's not that business saves the world because it internalizes the externality, because it can't. It's that it begins to engage with this problem in a real way. And in doing so, hopefully becomes part of the conversation about rebuilding our institutions. Okay, so I, uh, we, there were two things that popped up from your last uh, two sentences, I think. And I, as you I have speak, one too. I, I, I'm starting <laughs> to realize that you can find yourself being a supporter of free markets from a perspective of optimism, as in this is the potential for growth, and from pessimism, as in this is the system least likely to lead to restrictionist results. This might be our ideological difference. I, I arrive there from pessimism, you from optimism. And, and where I, I kind of detect the optimistic streak that, that I, I'm not completely sold on is the idea that a firm lobbying government to, quote unquote, get money out of government will do it truly for the reasons or goals that they claim to. For instance, when you think about Facebook saying, regulate me, I, we have so much hate speech, come, police us, treat us like a utility, which is basically what Mark Zuckerberg says before the American Congress. Like, I'm not, yeah, that's where, uh, that's where I'm starting to get suspicious. Put aside the fact that I don't trust uh, the American Congress to regulate anything, especially not high tech. 
there is something to the libertarian argument, and I'm certainly not a libertarian, but there is something to the argument that big firms thrive on government involvement because it locks out smaller competitors and because it sets the rules according to their standards. And at the same time, it also gives them a more direct line to the ears of politicians. And that's where the corruption question comes in. This is not necessarily a solution for corruption. No, no. So, uh, Adam, I, I am completely with you. I mean, when Facebook says, come regulate me, I mean, there are all kinds of problems with that. We have a great deal of data that firms capture regulation and use it to keep out small firms, and that's how they're using self-regulation. I'm totally with you. But try. I love it <laughs> when firms lobby for a price on carbon. You know, when the big consumer goods companies say, please, would you price carbon? Because otherwise, we, you know, we're not going to have any food. Um, when the... I actually... I'm a fan of recently of the CEOs coming out in favor of voting rights in Georgia. Um, yes, I think there are potential dangers. Yes, it makes me nervous when business is engaged with politics. But when I think there is a risk that the democracy is, is in the balance, I'm really glad when CEOs step up. So one of the reasons I talk about cultural change and purpose is I'm trying to suggest that the firms that do this should be very public about what they're doing and why they're doing, absolutely transparent. And, you know, you call me an optimist. I don't really think I am. Hmm. I mean, how did I get to where I am? Basically through despair. Hmm. You know, I think we're in a really tricky moment that our societies are under enormous stress, that our institutions are by and large not working well. And although it seems, you know, when I wake at four in the morning, I say to myself, Rebecca, you have to be kidding. I think it's at least worth talking about and exploring and trying because there really is a business case here. Leaving climate change unchecked and letting the democracy collapse and the populist rage run will be really bad for business. And so in a bizarre way, the concentration of power in the private sector, which is so dangerous in so many ways, but it means that these kinds of risks are kind of no longer externalities. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you can imagine a room where you get 200 people in the room and they say, this is really not working. Let, let's try and fix climate change. Let's do something about inequality at the bottom. So, you know, when you see these CEOs coming out and saying, we're going to hire black Americans, we're, you know, committed to reducing energy usage. I think two things are going on. One is they see a business case. Cool. They won't do it. They won't commit resources without the business case. So I'm all for the business case. But the other is an increasing, maybe this, maybe this is the optimistic part an increasing collective sense that there is a collective action problem, that they need to solve it. And that talking this up and putting in the metrics as well is one way to try and address this collective action problem. So again, I, the sinister- And the collective you know, sense is culture, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking about a normative shift in the entire society. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also about, because this is actually something that I'm getting now from our conversation that I didn't necessarily get from reading the book, which I think is really, really neat, which you t had a whole section about this idea of self-regulation being both, I think you say, inherently fragile, but immensely powerful, right? And I wanted to ask you about this because I was a bit skeptical about this idea of like, are, really, are people really going to come together to self-regulate? But now that I'm hearing you, it, it almost sounds like it's a step along the path, like if self-regulation is step one, then that will allow for this kind of future state that you see where, you're, where, where companies are asking for different types of regulation that come from externally, from like beyond this collective um, action. So can you talk about that a bit exactly, more? Exactly, Vanessa. And I didn't do a good, book, a good job of getting this across in the book. But I mean, let me give you a concrete example. So I was working with a bunch of consumer goods companies who were trying to stop deforestation. And um, they got 67% of the world's publicly traded palm oil to sign up for being deforestation free. And they got all the big uh, meat buyers to sign up for deforestation free from the Amazon. And you know, if you talked to me six or seven years ago, I would have said self-regulation, that's the answer. 
you know, you get the big Western buyers together, they force change in their supply chains. And, uh, and when I said this to one of the world's best historians of business self-regulation, he said what At Adam said, which is, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you know, no, 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 no. If it is in the public good, it won't be stable. And if it's not in the public good, you don't want it. But if it's in the public good, it won't be stable. And it turned out it wasn't stable. That, that self-regulation wasn't stable because you had people who were willing to play for the short term and not conform and free ride. And so I found myself in meetings where literally people said, OK, got to involve the local government. We've got to do this jurisdiction by jurisdiction. We've got to make it work for the local community. They have the enforcement power. And I heard this not just in the deforestation conversation, but in the IT conversation about uh, supply chains in, in Mexico and other places, in the apparel conversation about, oh, OK, we've, we've got to get them to enforce their labor regulations because otherwise we just cannot clean up the supply chains. So, you know, you, you can be cynical and say, well, these are baby steps and they are baby steps. But I've seen it in the U.S. in this last year with business leaders who I think really genuinely want to make progress on issues of equity. And they discover pretty quickly that you can't do it as a firm on your own. And one private equity leader I know, he sent a letter to all his companies in his portfolio that said, I want you to send the following letter to the mayor or the governor of the state or city in which you're located. We love being in your state. You have to do something about the education, transportation and healthcare systems hmm. or we're not going to hang around. And here's a check. Hmm. <laughs> You know, and I'm seeing, I mean, in Orange County, Orange County, there's a group of business people who are getting together saying, got to fix the local education system. The pipeline is broken. We can't bring people in from out of region because they don't stay. We have to reach out to the populations that are being excluded in the educational system. And it, it, it's, it's very slow, right? But I hope it's helpful. I mean, what we really need to fix the problems we're in is a massive political, social, and cultural movement. Check. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely check, check, check. All I'm suggesting is that business might be helpful, that finding allies in the private sector might be extraordinarily helpful if we are going to transform in the ways we need to transform. So here's the flip side of this. We, because we are in a, in a moment in a country that is both the moment and the country, incredibly, incredibly stupid. And things are um, bifurcated to a point of insanity. And if something benefits what we in imagine as the other side, then we ipso facto hate it, right? That, this is the, the current state. And even the most fundamental social agenda is something that we can't agree on. If, if you're for education, then I must be against it. If you're for equity, then equity is bad. And if you're for religious freedom, then religious freedom is bad. Whatever it is, we can't, we can't have a, a, any agreement on this. So how can you actually have a private sector that in, to some extent is more democratic than the, you can say that in certain aspects of the American democracy because it just responds to the market? Um, as opposed to being filtered through the uh, the electoral college or whatever, how can we have that actually reflect the changes that we agree on? Because as we see right now, whenever private firms take a political stance that one side of the political spectrum disagrees with, then you hear the calls to rein in the evil corporations. The, the left got really angry when Hobby Lobby asserted their religious freedom right. What, what was it called? A masterpiece cake shop had their, their whole thing, which was a First Amendment issue. But now you hear the right suddenly calling for regulations when corporations are fighting against the Georgia voting law. Mm. Well, obviously, nobody's really into democracy, let alone freedom of speech, obviously, because we don't want the other side to win. But <laughs> we certainly don't want them to win through those grubby, ugly corporations. So how do we how do we come like specifically in this stupid country? How do we actually get over this problem 
uh, where we can come together and say, like, these are real issues that we need solved. And corporations can be allies to an extent. How does that work? Oh, Adam, I wish I had an easy answer for you. I mean, it would help to stop social media being a kind of self-perpetuating <laughs> hate and polarization machine. So, no, you should have stopped the sentence that we should stop social media, period. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you could stop that, that, that would be great. But, but let me, again, be a little bit optimistic, which is the screaming is from relatively small populations at the extremes. And as you know, when you show people a list of, pub, of sensible policy proposals and you don't tell them which party proposed it, you get like huge majorities, like 73, right. 75% of people say, oh, yeah, it seems pretty sensible. And, and so there is a kind of, there is space in the middle. And, you know, I don't have the whole solution, but I think it's hopeful or maybe helpful that firms are increasingly saying, we have broader responsibilities, we care about the society. I mean, yes, there was a lot of screaming about corporations coming out in favor of LGBTQX rights, but I would argue that actually the fact that corporations very early on started giving benefits to same-sex partners and, and saying, you know, discrimination is out and sometimes really meaning it and increasingly really meaning it now has been a really important part of, just a part of, because the LGBTQX community themselves have played an enormous role, but it's been very helpful to have that support. And similarly, with the move towards equity, in my dreams, the corporation is one of the few places where people with very different backgrounds come together. And to the degree that corporations start saying, you know, we really are not going to pay attention to the color of this man's skin. You know, this is going to be about merit. We are going to actively try and include everyone. That that actually might be how we heal. I mean, this many hundred year old rift about how we think about race relations in this country, which is so poisonous and so deep. And I, I think that's as likely to be healed within firms. And again, I'm not saying done deal, optimistic, it's going to happen tomorrow, but, but maybe there's a chance that when people get used in a an, in an work environment to you know, just seeing people as people, which is kind of hard in the US right now, that that might make a huge difference. So I, uh, my pessimism is, is way <laughs> Past that, just deep. Because, okay. <laughs> no, no. And my, my concern is that the signals that these corporations take in order to try to interpret what the what social goods they need to protect come the, the signals come from social media or they come from sources that already filter and distort what people really want and then um, over index for the loudest screamers. <laughs> And we already, you know, we see that in politics. And that's not a good thing. So, Adam, Clearly. I, I really want to know your solution for our politics. <laughs> like, because I'm completely with you. I mean, if I can pick a solution, I'm picking a political solution. But that's, but that's why I invite, we invite you. I, I'm desperate for somebody to convince me. I want somebody to take me out of this cave of pessimism and show me the light. I want to be told, you're wrong. Stop being so jaded. But And, and maybe, maybe this will help a little bit, Adam, which is is there really are firms which mean it in a deep mm. way. And there are CEOs that mean it, not hundreds, but there are some. And um, their employees are really pushing them. Their customers are really pushing them. When that happens, you release, I think, enormous reserves of energy and engagement and excitement. Mm. And that is a real thing. And you know, is it purely democratic? No. Is it perfect? No. Is it better than the con conventional firm? I think it's infinitely better. So anyway, that's what I spend my time doing is, is trying to push firms more in that direction. Do I think that alone will solve our problems? Absolutely not. I'm counting on you to turn off social media and yeah. really create a new third party that is you know, <laughs> more sensible and, and can pull people from both edges. I mean, we could fracture, we could break both existing parties in half. It kind of feels like that might happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm. If you ask me about my perspective, I don't know if that's a solution for anything that we've talked about. But I'm very. My brain is always local, local, local. The more the you have smaller places that have a voice, and you can hear the variance and divergence of of different localities and their needs, and the more you have companies that need to both companies and government that need to respond to those different needs, the better the picture you have. And I think one of the biggest problems is 
just this flattening of national conversation, which happens both on the government and on the corporate level. And I think that's dangerous. Oh. When you have something like, um, um, Kate, like I don't know, uh, a Target try to be political, it's, it's terrible because they're speaking out for like a country, uh, for a continent-wide country. It's not, not going to work. And I don't know how you actually empower small localities. But my instinct is the more bargaining power they have, both politically and economically, they will actually be able to reflect more people's needs and resentments will cool down. And, and I would add to that, more local is more in community and more in relationship. Right. And the, the politics, I mean, I have friends who work at state and city levels, and they say the politics is paradoxically much less polarized because these are people you know, I mean, not in every state, but these are people you know, these are real problems, you have to be pragmatic. So, exactly. so I'm with you um, that taking the conversation and the power down to local levels can only be helpful. Well, right. Rebecca, thank you thank so much. You. Uh, thank, we, you for- uh, thank you for engaging us in this like weird, slightly drunk debate. And- <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much for your time and for, for your book, uh, Reimagining Capitalism, World on Fire. Recommend it to people to pick up and read. And on to your next engagement. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. This has been really, really fun. I love talking to people who uh, disagree with me. It, uh, it makes it fun. It sharpens ideas. And of course, the truth is always more complicated than a, a soundbite can capture. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. And, th- and, and thank you for your book. I, I think it's a perspective that really, really needs to be out there more, as opposed to the, the binary solution of rah-rah capitalism and, oh, obviously socialism. Then having, <laughs> it's like, it's such an important voice to be heard. And I really, I really hope that we can do our part to amplify well, it. Well, thank you very so. much. I really appreciate it because I'm completely with you. I mean, I'm trying to do my part of making some space in the center to, uh, to talk in a more reasonable way. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We're Uncertain Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're feeling generous, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. These help a lot and we'll appreciate it. Tell your friends and enemies and until next time, stay sane.